Once something snaps, it'll be a 72 hour event. Definitely unrest will start in the streets. I put the odds under 50-50 that the US even has an election. I mean, at that point, you're talking civil war. It divides the shit out of the population. Once the population is completely divided, then you pull the plug. What happens to the dollar? What happens to the financial system? Purchasing power is ultimately gonna go to zero. A million dollars will not buy a cup of coffee. Gold is the direct competitor to the dollar, but that's going to leave the average person with nothing. I mean, if you and I understand that the dollar is toast, do you not think governments are as smart as us? I think the Chinese understand that in the end, they're going to count their wealth in ounces. World War III is already happening. This is a house of cards, and it is in the process of collapsing right now. You're going to see an economic crash, the likes of which we've never seen. All right, guys, so I look forward to sharing this conversation that we had with Bill Holter with you. An excellent conversation, very insightful. The problem was we had some technical difficulties on our Zoom call. The audio was perfect, but the video, not so much. So just bear that in mind. There might be times when it's just better to have this playing in the background, but I assure you there's going to be a lot of great value in this conversation, so stick around. Hi, folks. Canadian Prepper here. It's an honor today to have Bill Holter on the channel, a renowned financial commentator, a precious metal expert, a 23-year veteran stockbroker, who currently clears through Miles Franklin. Now, what first intrigued me to wanting to have you on the channel, Bill, was something that you had said in an interview. I think it was on the channel Liberty and Finance. And you had said something to the effect of when the financial collapse starts, the whole thing could potentially unfurl in a relatively short period of time, much shorter than a lot of people think. And I know you're also a prepper, so I'm looking forward to Getting your insights on that down there in Texas. How are you doing today, man? And what is your? Uh, are you feeling bearish or are you feeling bullish? Um, I'm I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> bullish or bearish? I mean, that's like people. People will often say, "Oh, well, you're a pessimist." That's not the case. I'm a realist. I mean, I just take what I see, put those pieces together, and you know, whatever the result of that is, it is. And I mean, if you look at what's what's going on, basically, in a hundred percent of our our life, it, it's not good. If you look at the financial system today, everything is levered. There's more leverage in the system today than there has ever been on any metric, however you look at it. Um, there's over two quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives. That means basically, there's more bets than there are assets. So all the bets can't be cleared or, or paid off because the the assets, uh, the available cash is not there to pay the bets off. And what I was getting at is, and I, I may or may not have said this, uh, but I've said it many times, is that once this thing goes, once something snaps, it'll be a 72 hour event. It'll take three days. And it's, I guess, maybe a coincidence, I don't know, uh, that three days to a human stomach, you know, that's when people start getting pissed off is after three days. Uh, but from the financial standpoint, once there's a failure, once there's a derivatives failure, uh, and I mean, it very well could be silver or gold or some other commodity not being delivered. I mean, it could be any number of things. But once that happens, the world will spin three times and after the third turn, I don't think there's going to be any markets anywhere in the world open. And that's because you'll have the institutions themselves failing. Um, and we could go on a tangent here uh, regarding the great taking. But that's what the great taking is all about, is when the institutions fail, that's when the bail-ins rather than bail-outs will come. Banks are going to bail in. Brokers are going to bail in their customers, uh, stock positions. So the event itself, once something snaps, will be very quick. And as far as the real economy is concerned, the real economy will come to a standstill because it has to have credit to run. And with a financial collapse occurring, 
credit will not be available. So the real economy will basically grind to a halt. And then you get to uh, the individual situations where if they don't have food within 72 hours, you got a lot of pissed off people. And this failure to deliver uh, idea, could you maybe explain that a bit to people, what you're referring to there? I'm sure it's in reference to the discrepancy between the gold uh, paper contracts and the and silver uh, and right. the uh, physical amounts. So, but maybe could you just like explain that to me, like um, five years old? Yeah, I mean, if if uh, if you have one ounce of gold or one ounce of silver, but there's three hundred paper contracts against that ounce, so there's three hundred people who believe they own that ounce. Once somebody says, "Deliver me the ounce." There's no ounces left to deliver. And I mean, on a broader scale, uh, you know, once either COMEX or LBMA inventory is bled dry, and that's happening, by the way, be, uh, in a good part because of the arbitrage. Prices are higher in China for gold and for silver than they are in on COMEX or LBMA. So the natural trade is to buy in the, in the West sell it in the east and have that metal delivered from west to east you're get, you're locking in a guaranteed profit mm -hmm. and just one other thing i'll add uh because you you asked at the beginning uh you know well why why gold and silver that's very simple gold and silver are the only monies on the planet that cannot bankrupt and the world is in the process of bankrupting so what do you think might trigger this uh, failure to deliver? I mean, we know that uh, people in China, India are are stockpiling gold, even on the retail level. I think the central banks in China have uh, suspended, uh, not suspended, but in April, I believe their deliveries were uh, lower than projected. But uh, is, is it possible that this rush on, or I guess this arbitrage between west and east and this incentive for people to sell their gold in the east will be what triggers this potential failure to deliver or is there going to be some black swan event that uh, gets people to want to uh, request that their gold be delivered yeah it's a function of supply and demand the supply basically are the inventories that comax and lbma hold and the demand are the the contract holders whether they demand delivery or not and i mean demand worldwide is picking up you even see central banks buying gold uh you saw the biggest delivery month ever i believe uh for silver in india in april so it's a supply and demand question and once once the the demand for delivery outstrips the available inventory there's your failure to deliver. Yeah. And do you think there's any like precipitous event that you have in mind that you think might uh, precede uh, this type of uh, incident where all of a sudden the demand overwhelms the supply? Um, like I said, it could be a, any of a hundred or more, you know, potential events. All you need to do is look at the, at the daily news and you can put, you know, two and two together. I mean, just this week alone, you had uh, the Saudi Arabian deal, the 50-year yeah. petrodollar deal. That ended on Sunday. And then Wednesday, uh, Russia said, we will no longer use dollars or euros uh, in our banking system or our financial markets. I mean, that's a move away from the dollar. And if you look at the amount of countries that are looking to join the BRICS, how many countries are looking to join NATO or looking to join the West? Zero, yeah. other than Ukraine. And that's a complete another story. And that's that's a joke. But you have the rest of the world lining up behind the BRICS. So if the BRICS is not using dollars at a time that the U.S. government's got $10 trillion of debt that is expiring or maturing this year, where is the money going to come from to refinance that? Where's the money going to come from uh, that the Treasury needs as they're borrowing, call it a, a trillion dollars every three, four months? Where's that money going to come from? And the answer is 
It can only come from the Federal Reserve. They they will print the money, and and interestingly enough, the Fed and Treasury merged. What was it, two or three years ago? So it's basically an in-house. We need to borrow money. Okay, here it is. Yeah, and if and- that's the case, then what is that money? What is that money worth? If it could be printed free, and it's interesting because we've had you know the the Saudi Arabia uh, deal not get renewed, and we had the halt of uh, dollar trading on the on the Moex, and yet the dollar seems to be ticking upwards. Typically, this happens when there's going to be a global crisis because people are looking for an economic safe haven. Is this just a a natural knee jerk reaction? And we're going to see a, a precipitous drop in the the USD index, or how do you see the the dollar collapse unfolding? Well, you're assuming that markets are unfettered and trade freely, and I don't think that's the case. I think all markets are manipulated. Um, yeah, they've held the dollar together this week. What about next week? The following week? Two months from now? And and not to mention we have an election coming up which I put the odds now seriously under 50-50 that the U.S. even has an election. And I don't think they can have an election because those in power have committed crimes. And if they lose power, they'll be prosecuted for those crimes. So I think, you know, that's that's another added factor five months out that they need to kick the table over before we get to the election because we can't have an election. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about that in a moment. Um, but just to stay on this this topic of uh, potential market manipulation, we have seen some very suspicious behavior of metals. We've seen gold and silver get these uh, crazy spikes upwards, and then you get the paper slam. You get the the plunge protection come in and do whatever it is they do. Uh, what are your thoughts on the manipulation of the gold market? Maybe you can uh, share some insights with people as to how that works. Uh, in my opinion, the gold market has been uh, manipulated your and, and nearly my, well, actually even including my entire lifetime. I mean, go back to 1968, you had the London Gold Bowl. That was an overt manipulation. Then 1976, uh, they started trading on COMEX and able to trade paper. And after the 1987 crash, when uh, Reagan created the president's working group on financial markets, the plunge protection team, they figured out that they can use contracts to suppress the price of gold and silver. And that's what they've done ever since. And they have good reason to because gold is the direct competitor to the dollar. So you can't have, you can't have gold going uh, higher and moving strongly at a time when the U.S. government needs to borrow money because gold is the thermometer saying that, you know, dollars are in fact a poor choice. And the manipulation is there to show you dollar good, gold bad. And so right now we have a situation where the Chinese are willing to pay a premium so it's it's almost as if they know that the price of gold is going to be much higher and it's drastically undervalued and they're willing to pay that premium right now in anticipation of a supply shortage. Would you say that that's accurate? Um, mostly accurate. I don't think the Chinese even care what the price is. I think the Chinese understand that in the end, they're going to count their, their wealth in ounces or in, in real goods, not in dollars. Um, It's basically China and other central banks around the world trying to get out of the system, get out of the dollar system. I mean, if you and I understand that the dollar is toast and it's it's basically going to dry up and blow away, do you not think uh, governments, you know, sovereign treasuries are as smart as us or know more as much as us? They know way more than us. I mean, we've just figured out that the dollar's toast and the purchasing power is ultimately going to go to zero. But sovereign treasuries, foreign central banks, they know this. And that's what they're doing. They're getting out of dollars. So what do you think led to the price of gold just almost overnight, I mean, in relative terms, going from 
1800 19 2000 to 2300 and now it's just kind of fluctuating between 23 and 24 was there some geopolitical event that that occurred that precipitated this i mean everybody's got a different theory but what is your theory behind that my theory is backed up by a chart all you have to do is look at the gold chart going back to october and when was it that the united states first started talking about using uh russian reserves Steal, basically stealing the Russian reserves. And now they're talking about using Russian reserves as collateral to lend money to Ukraine. Gold started going higher almost the exact same day. And that's about the rule of law. Yeah, that's what uh, another guest we had on the channel, George Gammon of the Rebel Capitalist, uh, had suggested that indeed it was uh, this dealings with Russia and the falling out with the uh, seizure of not the actual assets themselves but the interest earned on the assets as they call it which likely will inevitably lead to a full seizure of uh, the assets and then concurrently you had the chinese really starting to uh, buy up a lot of gold perhaps in anticipation of this uh, what is your price projections I, I usually i save this question for last but while we're on the topic of precious metals uh, where do you see this going in six months, a year? I mean, so much can happen between now and then. We're really in a cycle of news now that every week another you know, unprecedented event occurs. But if you were to make a, a price target, if that's even meaningful, because, of course, we know that it's measured in dollars. So uh, but what would your price target be, say, six months to a year out for silver and gold? Um, I don't do time and price uh the only actually the only time i ever did time and price was uh i put out on may 11th that if you looked at charts you could see the hook forming and it looked like we were going to break out so yeah i did time and price there time and price six months out a year out uh at some point in time the question is going to be how many zeros are after the number because the opposite of infinity or the opposite of zero is infinity so, I mean, you could you could see a dollar that gets completely smoked and is not accepted where a million dollars will not buy a cup of coffee because dollars are not accepted. Yeah, it, it always amuses me when I hear uh, guys like Elon Musk talking about how they're going to be a $30 trillion company someday, thinking about exactly how much that trillion dollars is going to be worth at the time. For myself personally, I think gold is always the same price. You know, like I think getting into the mindset of the price of gold doesn't change. The currency that it's that it's measured in changes, but the price is always constant throughout history. You know, what an ounce of gold bought you 2,000 years ago would likely buy you the same today. Um, if you change the word from price to value, then yeah, I would agree with it. Uh, an ounce of gold 100 years ago, even 2,000 years ago, is still just an ounce of gold. And what's happened since we went off the gold standard in uh, 1971, man has started to measure the ounce of gold by various currencies. Whereas prior to that, the currencies were measured by an ounce of gold. So man has it backwards now. Interesting. Um, the the measuring factor if you will so how much of your analysis uh with with people relies on looking at geopolitics because there's so many uncertainties right now in the numerous theaters of conflict around the globe that in addition to the russian asset confiscation uh, there's other potential bullish factors for gold here namely uh, an outbreak of hostilities on multiple fronts. Is, is this something you, you look at or are you morally just looking at the, the technicals or? Well, let me ask you this. Why, uh, why historically does gold go higher in the face of hostilities? Well, I would have to say that it's a do with uncertainties over the stability of currencies. Exactly. So it's not the hostilities, it's the currency. So do you think that... The hostilities re reveal the weaknesses of the currencies and understand that all currencies today are fiat currencies. They're credit-based. We're at the very, very end game 
of a credit bubble. When the credit bubble bursts, so do the currencies. So, uh, yeah, you could say that that uh, geopolitical hostilities act as a spark or a match, but that's it's it's only a uh, it's only a, a a precursor or a cause, if you will, to people. People th think it through really quickly. Okay, uh, country X Y Z is is going to war. It looks like they're going to lose. What's going to happen to their currency? Currency is going to go down the toilet. I mean, every every country that's ever lost a war, their currency goes to zero if it's credit backed, if it's fiat. So that's your reasoning right there. Why uh, hostilities spark a move? into gold, into silver, because they cannot bankrupt, yet every other currency on the planet certainly can bankrupt or default, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and there's no shortage of that. Uh, the euro is definitely at risk. And some people might say that uh, the United States still divided by two oceans, having those buffers, as long as this thing doesn't go full-blown nuclear, might remain the economic safe haven and uh, enable them to continue to run up the tab. But you're you're quite certain that this thing has to pop at some point. Oh, well, mathematically has to pop. I mean, just look at the federal debt for the U.S. At this point, we're paying more. We're paying more than a trillion dollars in interest, and that's going to be by the end of this year. It'll be a trillion five or a trillion six thereabouts. Mathematically, that cannot continue. That's that's more than uh, the defense budget, which is more than all the defense budgets put together on the planet. So you, we're at the point where the interest alone is going to eat up too much tax revenue and not leave enough basically to run the country, much less police the world. Yeah. And it seems like right now we're just in this stasis with the markets where you know, it's kind of ticking upwards. It's, it's almost hit a bit of a plateau, though. When you look at the Dow, the NASDAQ, of course, is wildly out of control. But I mean, there has to be, and it seems as though the Fed is doing everything they can to just make sure that that stock market doesn't start trending downwards. Because as soon as it does, when people pair that with their diminished purchasing power, so we're seeing when we go to the grocery store how much stuff costs. And then as long as that stock market is not going down, people will have this false sense of confidence in spite of the fact that their their purchasing power is being inflated away. Yeah, I, I'm going to say 10 years ago, the saying was going around, we don't need no stinking economy so long as we have the Dow and S&P. And, and what, do you, what is that in reference to? Well, we don't need it. We don't need a real economy as long as we have the Dow and the S and P. Right. In other words, as long as stocks are up, everybody's rich. Yes, and so they'll do whatever it takes to ensure that that stays the same until they can't. And they've put laws in place already. And I mean, you can read the footnotes in the Great Taking that the laws have already been put in place to bail everyone in, to bail your assets in. Everything you have with a bank, everything you have with a broker, everything you have at an insurance company, the laws are on the books all over the world for these institutions to take their customers' monies, to save them, to save, quote, the system. But that's going to leave the average person with nothing. And that's where the you'll own nothing part comes in. The you'll be happy part, I don't know. Maybe it's something they put in the water, chemtrails, who knows? But the role at the AI virtual worlds for us all to be satiated with at that point. Well, that's that's the plan. So you think there's now, going to be if, if you that's the that's the plan. But you look at the if you look at the elections in Europe this past uh weekend, their their plan's not going to plan because you've got populists all over the world standing up saying, Hey, you know, this globalized globalism woke bullshit. I'm not going for it. You know, I'm a German. I'm a uh, I'm a Spaniard. I'm an American, whatever. 
populism is gaining big traction all over the world. Do you not think, though, that that's part of the manipulation? I mean, we've seen so many times where leaders uh, run on certain platforms and they claim it never ceases to amaze me how people continuously fall for the same old tricks. Like right, right. now you have Donald Trump talking about how he's going to end income tax. And, and I mean, like right. <laughs> he's going to make up for it by, by bringing tariffs on China or something. And we, we all know what that's going to mean. It's going to mean everything goes up in price, but you've talked about how they're going to use some kind of this type of situation that we're talking about to bring in a CBDC based system. Right. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, first off, you're right. Um, as far as being part of the plan to give false hope. Yeah. There's no question about that. Uh, but it is a, it's another division. If you look at if you look at the population today as an apple pie, that pie has been now sliced and diced. I don't know twenty different times, where you've got two separate slide se separate sides. But when you slice it uh, twenty times, it's almost impossible to find a single person who fits exactly in your slice. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, you've got the racial thing, you've got uh, yeah. gay versus straight, you've got uh, being being a Christian versus Muslim, you've got uh, Christian versus no faith, you've got abortion, no abortion, you have gun, no gun, Israel, uh, Palestine, you have vax, Russia, no vax, yeah. Israel, Palestine, exactly. You have so many of these different issues it divides the shit out of the population. Once the population is completely divided, then you pull the plug and you don't have any any big groups or factions that all agree on the same thing because that pie has been cut so many different times that even within uh even within you know one of the categories, you've got you know 10 10 other questions that divide that slice. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head because, you know, when I see this uh, quote unquote woke stuff, to me, it almost smacks of they do it intentionally because they know it's going to piss people off. It's almost like they're they're actively stoking the flames of, of division by just doing the most outrageous things just to get a reaction knowing that it's going right. to keep people's eyes away from the, what's fundamentally flawed in the system, which is what uh, our previous guest, uh, Rafi Farbred, indicated that uh, at the on the foundational level of, of corruption is the, the fiat-based system and all other the currency types itself. of degeneracy stems from that. Yeah, it's the currency itself. That's, that's, that's the flaw. The money's bad. And the money's been bad. I mean, the money's been completely bad since 1971. And the money was bad, but it had cover from 19, what, 33 to 1971, where four, only foreign central banks were able to convert dollars at $35 an ounce. So you advise people to stock up on you know precious metals uh is it namely just silver and gold or is there other metals that you uh assist people with i mean i can i can procure i can buy or sell any metal uh, i would caution people that uh platinum palladium those are not precious metals those are industrial metals silver is a monetary metal it's also an industrial metal uh not just industrial i mean you've got you have technological uses solar uses medicinal uses uh the uses for silver the the, the demand uh even in a bad economy demand is is still going to be there and if things go really bad then the monetary aspect takes over so really the only two precious metals are gold and silver those are the only two uh that will be in my opinion recognized as money you know what's amazing the Apparently, the demand for silver exceeded the supply last year, yet the price doesn't... That's three years. 
How is it the price doesn't reflect that? I, I don't understand that. I mean, I understand the contracts thing. Uh, but- that's how they do it. They sell naked contracts. And the price, until recently, price has been exclusively made on COMEX and on LBMA. And now you've got the Shanghai Exchange, which is you know trading for four plus dollars over uh, prices here in the United States and, and London. And is there any you know uh, obviously you've you've chosen a life of uh, self reliance? Uh, is is that something that is also obviously a hedge against this? And and how much of of I guess your preparedness revolves around things outside of silver and gold. Like what, what compelled you to get off? Well, I would just say nobody's going to protect me other than me. No one's going to protect you other than you. I mean, if you believe, if you believe that the government is here to help you or here to save you, you know, you're completely fooling yourself. Nobody else is going to protect you and your family other than you and your family. So, you know, to be self-reliant, uh, not only is it a, a good thing from the standpoint of not being able to have the rug pulled out from under you, like with a CBDC, you have your current, you've got your capital in that system, and you and I have this uh, this podcast, and they don't like what we're so click, they turn the account off. So it's a good thing to be self reliant, so that you can't be shut off. But it's also it's a gratifying thing to know that you lived your life righteously and you stood on your own two feet. I mean, I, I qualify for social security in a year and I'm not, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to give that money to a charity. I've never, ever taken a, a dime from government for, for anything ever. And I never will. And that's just a matter of principle. And I get it. Yes. I paid into social security, but piss on them. Yeah. And, and so what are you, what sort of things do you got going on in terms of your uh, homestead? Would you call it that or? Yeah. Uh, you want to, first and foremost, you want to be away from population. I bought a ranch because of the infrastructure and it was, it was older infrastructure. So the first, when I moved in here, uh, you know, I had to refurbish pretty much everything. I've got a couple of greenhouses. I've got a stock pond. I have two separate water wells. Uh, the wild game is, I mean, you could go out any night and shoot something. And that and that will go away. That will get shot up and eaten pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, you, you want to do things. You want to make sure you want to make sure you have power. Um, I've got a couple generators, which I hope I don't ever need to use because I've got two separate solar systems, one for the for the buildings and another separate solar system just for the uh, the two water wells. Uh, so you want to make sure you have power. You want to make sure you have the ability to get water. Um, I put a hand pump in my in one of my uh, pump houses so that if I don't have power, I still get water. Let's say the pump that that hand pump breaks i've got a, a acre and a half pond that i can haul water and purify it you know boil it whatever um so you need you need the basics um you need to stock up on on food that will last you need to try to do things to create food in current terms like greenhouses now here in texas we really it's difficult to grow in the summer because it's too hot our growing season uh, in greenhouses would be from September to maybe end of April because it starts getting too hot. It's super hot at the end of August, early September, but you're planting seed. And seed will come up, and then October comes, and it's about the right temperature. So, I mean, just basically uh, try to try – to, and I've said this before – Go home on a Friday, shut your lights off, shut your water off, and yeah, then and then try, implement try whatever your plan is. Do you, do you even have a plan? And if you're going home on a Friday night and it's in the middle of a city, well, good luck, you're dead. Because 
like I said, 72 hours. At the end of three days, people's stomachs start gnawing, and parents will do anything to feed their children. Well, I think that's uh, a testament to your integrity as a as a gold broker because I've often said, you know, like you could tell uh, judge a person by their actions, and if a person is is trying to sell you that on this idea that you know, precious metals are a sound investment and they're not practicing a lifestyle of preparedness, you know, I would call into question their motives. So the fact that you're doing that, I think is a testament to the, you know, the fact that you, you know, you truly do uh, believe in this thing. And, you know, I, I think at this point in time, it, it's, uh, this is something we've been pushing a lot on the channel recently is to, uh, to encourage people to, to try to not only procure those things that preserve value like gold and silver, but also there's many other things that are going to be valuable. I mean, gold and silver are just means to an end. I mean, you can't eat them. Sure, you can do some industrial stuff right. with them, as you're saying, but ultimately people want stuff. So if you can have that stuff in place and then whatever surplus you have, put it into something that can store that value like gold and silver, then that's a as good as it's going to get in terms of winning strategy. Do you invest in the markets at all? or? Uh, yeah, I, I do have some stocks, mostly mining stocks, got some uh, oil and gas, natural resources, but I hold almost all my certificates. And the reason being, as I mentioned earlier about the great taking, when your broker goes down, whatever stocks you have with them and bonds, uh, they are on your broker's balance sheet. They are not in your name. They are held on the balance sheet of the broker for your benefit. And when they go down, you are a subordinated creditor. Just like when you think you're depositing money into a bank, you're not. You're lending the bank money. And when that bank goes down, you are a subordinated creditor. You're going to get back zero. Yeah, and I guess if people so, yes. to if people were to consult with you, they could get advice on how exactly to do that. Because I think a lot of people, they have sure. those trading accounts. They they don't realize that their money is not in their control. Yeah, and let me let me clear that up so that I don't get a million emails. Um, I mean, if you have a question about how to do it, go back, rewind to where we are right now. If you got a, if you got stocks with a broker and you want the certificates, you call your broker. You tell them you want to direct register your shares, DRS, the shares, with the transfer agent. That's basically the broker sending the transfer agent the shares electronically. Once those shares are at the transfer agent, then you contact the transfer agent directly and tell them, send me the certificate. It should probably cost you 20, 25 bucks. A broker will do it and charge you 500. So to avoid that, Take the step of having the broker send electronically to the transfer agent, then you contact the transfer agent and have them send you the certificate. Once you have a certificate in hand, don't lose it because if you do, it's going to cost you three or four percent in the form of a bond to get it replaced. But when the system goes down and all these shares and positions are gobbled up by bankrupt brokers, you have a piece of paper that says, I own X percent, whatever however small it may be, of Corporation XYZ. That's your proof. That is like a car title. Wow, that's great advice. So you guys better bookmark this video, download it, and make sure you uh, go and do that if you still got some holdings out there. I, I know you're holding lots of Bitcoin and meme coins as well. Uh, tell us a bit about your crypto portfolio. No, you don't. <laughs> No, you don't. That's complete. That's complete. In my opinion, it's complete bullshit. Cryptocurrency is digital air. And I believe it was created as a pressure valve, if you will, to keep capital from the gold and silver markets. I agree, man. I mean, uh, clearly I'm being sarcastic, but, you know, I mean, when you look at it, when it emerged, you know, around 2008, suddenly this Satoshi character, you know, manifests uh, out of the universe and creates this thing that everybody starts dumping their money in. And it starts being 
uh, sort of tacitly promoted by the media, not directly. You know, they always have to make it out like it's a rebellious thing. But uh, the reality is, it's just like you're saying, if all of that money were to start flowing into some other economic safe haven, which is not to say that the technology itself might not serve some use in the future. But... It does. It it does. The blockchain is perfect. The blockchain is a perfect accounting system. But if you're accounting for piles of dog crap, it's a perfect accounting system of dog crap. Yeah. So, I mean, the question is, what's the asset? And in my opinion, uh, cryptocurrencies, they're digital air. They're nothing. I, I think this is exactly what we expect to see this in this late stage of the game in terms of a uh, the end of a financial cycle, just really outlandish and absurd bets on uh, things, trying to get rich quick. And it's, uh, I guess it's a consequence right. of of people's inability to to want to really you know pour any sweat equity into anything and just just trying to get as much as they can for as minimal effort as possible and that it's that sort of rapacious greed that caused the problem as quick the as they can and uh, easy come easy go as they say now you said uh earlier on in the conversation that you thought there would be no election or that there was a i don't want to misquote you there was a you know less than 50 percent chance that there might not be an election uh, maybe could you expand on that a little bit as to why you think that might be the case? Uh, for several reasons. One, because the math to the financial system is really not adding up now. The, the math itself, as far as uh, the debt service numbers, the debt can't be paid. And more and more people are figuring out that this is a never pay model. That, that, that the current the debt can't be paid off in today's current terms. That's the first thing. Um, and the table's got to be kicked over so that the powers that be can say, our plans were working except for this nuclear bomb or that pandemic or whatever. They've got to be able to point at something and say, hey, it wasn't our fault. That's the first thing. Mm. The second thing is, uh, and this is not just the United States. I mean, it's worldwide. But in the United States, uh, the amount of criminality over the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, you could go back to uh, 2001 with 9-11, criminality. You could go back to, and I'm sure I'm going to get all kinds of shit for this, but was Obama a citizen? My opinion is Obama was the biggest joke foisted on the american people just go you know keep going forward covid criminality i mean there's criminality everywhere the january 6th committee uh the 2020 election there's criminality everywhere and if those who are in power now lose power and the judicial system is turned at them they're all going to jail so in order to avoid jail, they've got to put something forth that cancels the election because they're not going to give up power willingly. Yeah, I I mean, it's definitely a possibility. I mean, so many things could happen right now. It could be a cyber attack. It could be the bird flu. It could be a nuclear incident. It, it could be could anything. Be, I mean, the, the question is, though, would how many people would go for that? Because... You also have a lot of uh, reflexive contrarians out there who will immediately, no matter what happens, think that it was all part of a, a plan, right? And they will, at least they claim, resist this type of uh, move by the government to postpone elections. I mean, it just seems unthinkable that they would be able to pull that off in practical terms. Uh, don't you think they would just create another fall guy or make sure that Trump was on board with whatever the plans were going to be? I mean, um, so I'm just trying to be the devil's this. advocate here. Yeah, I'm going to devil's advocate right back at you. Um, so let's say something does happen and the election's canceled and you've got people hopping pissed off, uh, protesting. So what? How, how do you get an election done when they say there's no election? How do you force an election? I mean, at that point, you're talking civil war. 
Yeah, but I mean, how do you think that, like, did because sometimes I wonder, you know, if people are all talk, you know, because often you see it happening, especially nowadays, people have gotten quite used to, uh, to just sitting on the computer and talking trash online and not having to actually go out and put their money where their mouth is. I, I could see that, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe they'll cancel the election and people will just be pacified and we'll be off to World War III and, and that'll be it. I mean, I, I would presume, though, that unrest would foment in the streets in some capacity. Yes. It might start. Oh, absolutely. So, so you think yeah, that... Uh, a... Yeah, definitely. Definitely unrest will start in the streets. But under that scenario, what happens to the dollar? What happens to... Uh, what happens to treasuries? Yeah. Do, do, or do they get dumped wholesale? Uh, what happens to the financial system? The financial system will come down. Everything's run on confidence. Credit runs on confidence. Mm -hmm. And once confidence breaks, everything breaks. And once credit breaks, nothing, nothing. And if you can think of something other than uh, the flow of water in the brook, you know, on your property, nothing is going to flow other than something that's natural because everything runs on credit. There's nothing that runs without credit in today's world. So what they need is some black swan event, some, uh, I don't want to say the word, but I'll say the word, false flag event in order to usher in some kind of collapse of the financial system or excuse for the collapse that would absolve uh, the powers that be of responsibility. An excuse, exactly. Because it's going to happen one where it's going to happen either naturally, given time, and, and that may only be six months to a year, year and a half, who knows. But if they have an excuse, they can pin the tail on that donkey. And so you don't see any prospect of a soft landing with this $35 trillion in climbing debt? Not possible. No way. How? Some people say they, they have a debt jubilee and they they uh, you know, hyperinflate away the debt. Is that <laughs> realistic? Bullshit. Bullshit. Wait a minute. A debt jubilee? Okay. What does that mean? A debt jubilee means anybody who owes stuff doesn't owe it. It also means anyone who owns stuff doesn't own it. Think about all the debt that people own in their pensions, in Social Security, uh, th there's two sides to every loan. Mm. There's a lender and a borrower. And if the borrower gets to say, piss off, then the lender is left with nothing. So a debt jubilee is not some kumbaya moment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you're, uh, you know, I people always accuse me of being the, the pessimist. And I always say I'm a realist, but you're... You're a lot more realer than I am. Uh, it's it, it's it's very uh, it's difficult because you know you it's easy to be lulled into this state of complacency when you you look at Western media and you just hear crickets and it just appears that everything is just fine. You know, just keep on investing; nothing's going to happen. And it's important, I think, for people to to understand that what, uh, I mean, often people of your... Well, Nate, we hear more than crickets. We do hear more than crickets from the media. And I think, and I've, I've told people this now for uh, several years, be thankful that there is a media because you don't have to do your homework. If they're saying it, it's bullshit. Just take the inverse. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Bill, it's been a, a fascinating conversation, and I would encourage people to go and check out your website, BillHolter.com. Uh, maybe just uh, remind us again a, a bit about what you can help people with with respect to financial consulting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am a precious metals broker. I mean, I can help you with any type of uh, precious metals needs, whether it's buying, selling, storing. Um, we can ship to most places throughout the world. Um uh, so, yeah, I can help you with any precious metals needs. And, I mean, obviously, in the course of a conversation, somebody's going to say, oh, well, I have stock with my broker. And I might mention to them, do you really want to hold the stock at your broker? I mean, it's a broad, you know, finance is a, is a broad topic. I worked as a stock broker for 23 years. 
was a branch manager for 12. Uh, so I know the ins and outs. I, I know what the, what the, uh, what the model is. And here's, here's another perfect example. Out of these brokers have big, huge buildings, a huge amount of employees, pay people two, three, five hundred thousand dollars a year, but yet they only charge seven ninety five on a trade because they take your stock and they lend it out, mm. and that's how again it goes back to the great taking. Your stock is not your stock; it's been lent out. That's how you could do a million dollar trade for seven dollars and ninety five cents, and the firm is that firm going to make. 5% a year on your assets. So if you have a million dollars with them, they're earning 50 grand a year, basically risk-free to them. Wow. I mean, what I'm getting at is there's a lot of other topics that get brought up in doing a gold or silver trade, you know, just through conversation. Well, anyways, man, it's been great uh, having you on and I hope to have you back once again, guys, go and check out Bill Holter dot com and, and i'd encourage you to check out some other interviews and and just uh keep tabs on the blog because he's always got something interesting to say thank you for coming out sir thanks for having me nate the best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at canadianpreparedness.com where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices no junk and no gimmicks use discount code prepping gear for 10 percent off don't forget the strong survive but the prepared thrive Stay safe.